My name is Ann Raldo, and I am an assistant professor in radiation oncology here at UCLA. And today I'm going to be talking about modern radiation therapy techniques in the treatment of esophageal cancer. Here are my disclosures. So today I'm going to be talking briefly about epidemiology, risk factors, anatomy, clinical presentation, and workup of esophageal cancer. But I'm going to spend most of my time uh, discussing the overall treatment paradigm for esophageal cancer, getting into um, some of the radiation therapy basics, um, and discussing radiation treatment planning. And then finally, I'm going to review some of the more recent literature that has come out regarding uh, esophageal cancer and how to guide our treatment decisions. So with respect to epidemiology, there's approximately 18,000 new esophageal cancer cases diagnosed um, with just about 16,000 deaths per year in the United States. And unfortunately, most patients do present with locally advanced disease. The incidence of esophageal cancer peaks in the seventh and sixth decades of life, and men are four times as likely as women are to get esophageal cancer. When we think globally, squamous cell carcinomas account for about 90% of cases, and the majority of those cases arise in endemic regions of Eastern Europe as well as Asia, and the majority of squamous cell carcinomas occur in the mid-esophagus. However, adenocarcinomas are more common in North American and uh, Western European countries, and there they compromise about 70% of cases. And the majority of adenocarcinomas are located near the gastroesophageal junction, otherwise known as the GE junction. So the risk factors are a little bit different for squamous cell carcinomas and adenocarcinomas. I'll start with squamous cell carcinomas. The number one risk factor for squamous cell carcinomas is poor nutritional status and a low intake of fruits and vegetables. Um, however, smoking and alcohol also plays a role in developing squamous cell carcinoma, as does drinking beverages at high temperatures. And sometimes underlying esophageal diseases like achalasia and caustic strictures can also contribute. Uh, recently, there's been um, some work regarding the role of HPV in the development of squamous cell carcinomas as well. For adenocarcinomas, the number one risk factor is Barrett's esophagus, which is also known as squamocolumnar metaplasia. And the risk of developing adenocarcinoma is about half a percent per year for non-dysplastic lesions. For dysplastic lesions, the risk per year developing adenocarcinoma increases significantly. Uh, for adenocarcinoma, other risk factors also include obesity, GERD, and cigarette smoking, although cigarette smoking is less so of risk factor for adenocarcinoma than it is for squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, hiatal hernias, as well as epidermal growth factor polymorphisms are also risk factors for developing adenocarcinomas. So with respect to anatomy, the esophagus itself is about 25 centimeters long. It begins at the cricopharyngeal muscles, which is about 15 centimeters from the incisors. And then it extends to the GE junction, which is about 40 centimeters from the incisors. And if you're thinking about how that lines up with vertebral bodies, because at least physicians often think about anatomy with respect to vertebral bodies, the esophagus extends from C6 to T10. Uh, the gastroesophageal junction tumors are defined as those that are within five centimeters from the true G junction, and they're frequently classified according to a modified Seward system. So um, superiorly in the esophagus, there is non-keratinized squamous epithelium, and that transitions to gla glandular epithelium more inferiorly. And as you can see on the right side of that picture, the esophagus, unlike other GI organs, does not have a true serosa. And unfortunately, the adventitia provides little barrier to local spread, which is one of the reasons why patients with esophageal cancer present uh, locally advanced. In addition, there is an extensive submucosal lymphatic plexus that often results in skip metastases and also allows for extensive lymphatic dissemination of disease. So radiation oncologists are very interested in patterns of spread because that guides our treatment volumes. So upper one third esophageal lesions typically drain um, to supraclavicular, cervical and superior mediastinal nodes. Uh, middle esophageal cancers can drain either superiorly or inferiorly. 
And then the lower third um, lesions drain to the lower mediastinal nodes and also the celiac nodes. All esophageal cancers end up uh, draining to periesophageal lymph nodes. And as I mentioned before, there are skip lesions uh, seen frequently in this disease. So how do most patients with esophageal cancer present? Probably um, the most common symptom is progressive dysphagia. Uh, first patients start having problems with swallowing solids and eventually liquids. Patients can present with weight loss. Uh, they can also have severe heartburn that does not respond well to medical therapies. And then they can also present with symptoms of asymptomatic blood loss, um, as well as melana, uh, so dark bloody stools. Um, uh, in addition, uh, although pretty rare, uh, as far as I've seen, patients can uh, also present with symptoms of laryngeal nerve paralysis. Um, and those symptoms include hoarseness, cough, and pneumonia. So uh, with respect to workup, any good workup obviously begins with a very thorough history and physical. You want to pay very careful attention to the neck and abdominal exam. Patients with esophageal cancer should get routine blood work. Uh, patients should get HER2 new testing if they have unresectable, recurrent, or metastatic adenocarcinoma because a large minority of these patients are actually HER2 new positive, which can guide uh, treatment decisions. And um, with respect to imaging, patients should get a PET CT with both oral and IV contrast. To get pathology, patients should have an upper endoscopy with biopsy. They should also have an endoscopic ultrasound, which is very helpful in determining T and N staging. And then if patients have lesions that are either at or above the carina, they should also get a bronchoscopy just to rule out a tracheoesophageal fistula. So radiation plays a huge role in the treatment paradigm for esophageal cancer uh, because radiation is the standard of care or component of the standard of care in patients who have stage two to 4A disease. The general standard of care for patients with esophageal cancer is to get preoperative chemoradiation with a dose uh, between 41.4 to 50.4 gray. When patients have um, unresectable disease, or a resection would result in significant morbidity, or patients really just aren't operable candidates. Uh, the standard of care is to do definitive chemoradiation. And this is particularly a standard for patients with cervical esophageal cancer where a surgery would really result in a lot of morbidity. And the dose uh, standard is 50.4 gray, but in cervical esophageal cancers, oftentimes pay, uh, people are treated between 60 and 66 gray, uh, and that's extrapolating from the head and neck literature. And then, of course, postoperative chemoradiation can also play a role if a patient during surgery is upstaged. So I've told you that radiation therapy really plays an integral part in the treatment of these patients, but what is radiation therapy? So radiation therapy is the use of various forms of radiation to safely and effectively treat cancer as well as some other diseases. It works by damaging the DNA within cancer cells. And once this happens, the cancer cells aren't able to divide. And radiation kills cancer cells either by directly affecting the DNA or by indirectly affecting the DNA by oxidizing water, which makes free radicals that diffuse towards the DNA and cause damage. Of note, this is why we don't want patients um, taking antioxidants because we do want to induce the formation of those free radicals. So um, the impact of DNA damage um, is basically uh, three potential outcomes. You can either have a cell repair the DNA damage, that cell can die either through apoptosis or mitotic error, or a mutation can occur, which may or may not have a, a deleterious effect in offspring cells, and it can also unfortunately lead to carcinogenesis. So why does radiation kill cancer cells but not normal cells? Well, DNA damage repair is an ongoing process in normal cells, um, but unfortunately or fortunately, cancer cells have um, accumulated a bunch of mutations in the DNA re uh, damage repair mechanisms. And so once their DNA, damage, DNA is damaged, they're not able to repair that damage and then they die off. And how do the normal cells survive? Well, this all lies in fractionation, uh, which basically means that 
uh, we in radiation typically give daily small doses of radiation for a total large dose. It allows uh, repair of DNA in the normal cells, and at the same time, it increases the lethality of radiation to tumor cells because it allows those tumor cells to reoxygenate and also allows them to redistribute in the cell cycle. So here on the right, you can see a curve uh, showing how normal tissue cells respond differently to radiation than cancer cells. So at the top, you see the normal tissue cells. After each radiation fraction, they're basically able to repair themselves. Uh, but the cancer cells are not able to repair themselves. And so ultimately, with enough uh, radiation doses, they will die off. But we do know um, that at a certain dose, toxicity does result. Normal healthy tissues do not have, you know, an endless um, capacity for radiation. And the challenge is really to find the dose at which there's a high rate of tumor control, uh, but um, a low risk of toxicity. As a side note, um, we do sometimes give one uh, to five large doses of radiation. This is known as radio surgery, SRS, or stereotactic body radiation therapy, or SBRT. That can only be given when we have a small target and we're, when we're able to treat with a minimal to no margin. That is not the case uh, when we treat definitively for esophageal cancer because we have to cover a larger treatment volume. So uh, the radiation that we give for esophageal cancer is delivered through external beam radiation therapy. Uh, a linear accelerator or a LINAC for short rotates around the patient at very precise positions and it delivers radiation therapy in predetermined shaped portals. And as um, the x-rays uh, leave the LINAC, they're shaped, uh, they're shaped to conform to the shape of the patient as well as the tumor. And there are different types of external beam radiation therapy with different uh, levels of sophistication. There is 2D radiation, which we really don't deliver uh, anymore. Uh, that was something of the past. But currently we deliver 3D conformal radiation therapy. We deliver IMRT, of which there are multiple different subtypes, including multi-field IMRT, rapid arc, tomotherapy. And then of course, um, there's something that I previously mentioned, serotactic radio surgery and serotactic body radiation therapy. I've put um, a list of brand names uh, of different types of machines that deliver SRS or SBRT so that you know that Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife, the V-Ray, all of these are just brand names of machines that deliver SRS and SBRT. For esophageal cancer, we use an IMRT technique. Um, and the reason that we use an IMRT technique as opposed to a 3D conformal technique is because we know that IMRT reduces cardiac mortality. That was shown in the SEER Medicare analysis. And IMRT is a very advanced mode of high precision radiotherapy that uses con uh, computer controlled Linux to deliver this precise radiation dose to a target. It allows for the radiation dose really to conform to the three-dimensional shape of the target. And um, it's basically doing this because we control the intensity of the radiation beam from multiple different angles. On the right side of the page, you can see that the um, orange or red um, color denotes the high dose uh, areas that are getting radiation. And you can see that on the right, which is, represents the IMRT dose distribution, that the um, dose is really much more conformed to the target itself, which in this case, or in this example, is the larynx. So before any patient starts getting uh, their radiation treatment, they have to come into our department for a radiation planning session or a simulation. And during this simulation or radiation planning session, we will position the patient in the same way that we'll have them treated in. And then we'll take a CT scan so the way we uh, position patients for esophageal cancer um, treatment is to have them lie supine, um, typically with their arms up on a VAC lock. A VAC lock, as you can see in the bottom right-hand side of the screen, is basically a bean bag with all the air sucked out of it that conforms nicely to the shape um, 
of the patient. And this not only keeps them comfortable, but also serves as an immobilization device. So it allows us to set up the patient the same way each time that the patient comes in for radiation. Um, this uh, this um, arms up on a vac lock technique is used for patients who have mid and distal esophageal cancers. If someone has a uh, more superior or cervical esophageal cancer, we typically set them up with a thermoplastic mask that covers the head, neck, and shoulder. That really is the better mobilization device. And then uh, if patients have a GE junction tumor, we also um, will account for their respiratory motion uh, by doing a four-dimensional CT because we want to make sure that we know exactly how the target is moving with different phases of the breathing cycle. For patients who have a more uh, distal uh, esophageal cancer, we'll ask that the patient uh, does not eat or drink about two to four hours prior to treatment. And that is because we want the stomach to be smaller rather than large because it decreases our treatment volumes. And then patients are simulated with IV contrast. Sometimes we use oral contrast or esophatrast, but usually a PET-CT fusion will really help us see exactly where the target is. So uh, when we do our contouring or our drawing um, or designing of radiation therapy fields, there are a couple of different um, things that we take into account and different volumes that we draw as radiation oncologists. So there's the GTV, which is the gross tumor volume. There's the CTV, which is uh, the clinical target volume, basically accounting for any microscopic spread of disease. And then there's PTV or the planning target volume, which is an additional margin that we add in order to account for daily setup variation. So the GTV or gross tumor volume is exactly what the name uh, suggests, which is that that's the tumor itself that we see on all the diagnostic uh, studies that the patients had. For the CTV, we really take into account patterns of spread. So um, we, because esophageal cancer tends to um, spread uh, mucosally, we will um, do a three to four centimeter superior and inferior expansion. And then uh, in order to cover lymph nodes that might be at risk, we do a one to one and a half centimeter radial margin. And of course, we uh, will cut out things that we know doesn't have um, disease in it, such as the heart, the liver, the vertebral body. Um, and then for lower uh, esophageal cancers, we make sure we also include the celiac lymph nodes uh, because they tend to uh, spread there as well. And then the planning target volume, that really depends on what kind of image guidance uh, you have available. In our department, we do uh, daily image guidance. And so we use a PTV or planning target volume of 0.5 centimeters or a half a centimeter expansion on those volumes. And this is a little video that I wanted to show you, basically showing you what the radiation treatment volumes end up looking like. So you can see in orange is the gross tumor volume, in red is the clinical target volume, and then in pink is the planning target volume. So this is the heart and soul of what we do in radiation oncology, which is design these treatment fields. And you can see here that this particular simulation scan has been fused to the patient's diagnostic PET-CT, which has really helped um, determine what our treatment volumes are. And this is what a final um, esophageal plan might look like. So you can see that, uh, again, the high dose distribution is really where uh, the target is. And we've done our best to avoid the normal healthy tissue, such as the heart, the lungs, and the spinal cord. And we use very strict dose constraints uh, to make sure that uh, as we're treating the target, we're also protecting the normal healthy tissues as much as possible. Ultimately, that's our goal, to deliver um, radiation to the target, but to protect the normal healthy tissues. And for esophageal cancer patients, those normal healthy tissues um, tend to be the lung, the spinal cord, the bowel, the kidneys, uh, the liver, and the stomach. So I wanted to transition a little bit from radiation treatment planning and discuss some of the relevant literature that has really informed our uh, modern treatment decisions for uh, these patients. Before I discuss some of the more uh, recent literature, 
that has come out, I wanted to just acknowledge some of the key trials uh, that have come out previously and which we base our treatment decisions on as well. So in 1999, RTUG 8501 was published and that showed the benefit of definitive chemo radiation over radiation alone. In fact, this study had a 0% overall survival for patients who got radiation therapy alone at five years, suggesting that radiation alone is a purely palliative treatment if it's not combined with chemotherapy. In 2002, the intergroup 0123 study came out, and that showed no benefit of dose escalation above 50.4 gray. Although what's interesting about this study is that the majority of patients who died in the dose escalation arm actually died before they even reached the 50.4 gray arm. So this study has been quite controversial. In 2005, the German STAL trial was published, and that showed no difference in overall survival, but improvement in cancer-specific survival and local control with chemoradiation and surgery versus chemotherapy and radiation alone. And then in 2008, the CLGB9781 study was published, showing a benefit of chemoradiation plus surgery over just surgery alone. And then more recently uh, was the CROSS trial, which showed the benefit of chemoradiation plus surgery over surgery alone as well. And no esophageal cancer talk is complete without a discussion of the CROSS trial. So the CROSS trial included 366 patients with esophageal or G junction tumors. 75% of those patients had adenocarcinoma, 23% had squamous cell carcinoma, and the primary endpoint of the trial was overall survival. In this trial, patients were randomized to either surgery alone or chemoradiation to 41.4 gray in uh, 23 fractions with concurrent carbo and taxol, and then they had surgery within four to six weeks after completion of chemoradiation. And you can see here that median survival uh, improved drastically with the addition of preoperative chemoradiation, 24 months to 49 months with the addition of chemoradiation. Five-year survival also increased. Uh, the R0 resection rate was higher with preoperative chemoradiation. And interestingly, there was a pathologic complete response rate achieved in almost 30% of patients. Uh, when you looked at the subgroups, almost half of the squamous cell carcinoma patients had a pathologic complete response, and 23% um, did in the adenocarcinoma group. The 30-day mortality was not statistically uh, significantly different between the two arms. So the conclusion of the CROSS trial was that preoperative chemoradiation improved survival among patients with potentially curable esophageal or G junction cancer. But um, since the CROSS trial, there have been several new studies that have helped um, to guide our treatment. One question that has been asked is, what is the best chemotherapy regimen? Is it carbotaxel or is it something else? So um, the CLGB8083 uh, trial uh, was recently presented at ASCO in 2018. Uh, this is a phase, uh, randomized phase two trial of PET scan directed combined modality therapy for esophageal cancer. And it include uh, locally advanced esophageal adenocarcinoma patients who got a PET scan pretreatment and were then randomized to either induction chemotherapy with Folfox or induction chemotherapy with carbotaxel. After induction chemotherapy, these patients had a PET scan and then the PET responders uh, we're allowed to continue with their initial chemotherapy um, concurrent with radiation to 50.4 gray. The PET non-responders, however, crossed over to the alternative chemo and had that uh, concurrently with radiation. And then all patients proceeded to surgical resection about six weeks after radiation. And you can see here um, that Patients who responded to their initial chemotherapy regimen had a much higher pathologic complete response rate, respond, response rate than those who did not respond. 26% uh, in responders versus 18% in non-responders. Um, and although it didn't meet statistical significance, uh, responders did have a longer median overall survival than those non-responders, 28.9 months versus 47.3 months. And on the right, you'll see that 
um, the full Fox responder group uh, did the best. Um, you can see that um, they had the least number of events and the median overall survival as well as the two-year overall survival was highest in this group. So another question that has been hotly debated and asked is, is surgery necessary for patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinomas who've had a complete clinical response after chemoradiation? We know based on the cross trial that these patients uh, respond really well to radiation. So do they need surgery after? This was a trial that was published in 2019, a randomized phase three trial on the role of esophagectomy in complete responders to preoperative chemoradiation in patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. This trial, um, in this trial, patients had induction chemotherapy with capecitabine and cisplatin. Then they had preoperative chemoradiation to 50.4 gray. And if they had a clinical complete response, they were randomized to either observation or surgery. Of course, if patients didn't have a complete clinical response or they had progressive disease, patients underwent surgery automatically. This is a table showing the failure patterns for patients in this study. And you can see that first failure patterns for these patients with esophageal uh, squamous cell carcinoma is local regional relapse. Although it doesn't meet statistical significance, you can see that patients who underwent surgery had many uh, less local regional relapses than those who uh, underwent observation. So per this study, it, you know, it really suggests that surgery plays an integral role in preventing local regional relapse in these patients. This is a, a um, slide showing the disease-free survival, progression-free survival, time to progression, overall survival according to treatment arm. As I previously mentioned, surgery does appear to really have a significant role in uh, preventing local regional relapse. But in this study, which perhaps is under pover, underpowered, um, the overall survival, at least on the graph, doesn't, mean, doesn't seem to be much different between those who underwent surgery and those who underwent observation. And then a third really um, hotly debated question, especially among radiation oncologists, is does dose escalation improve outcomes for patients? You'd think that the higher the radiation dose, uh, the more likely you are to you know, kill all the cancer. So you'd think that dose escalation would improve outcomes, but literature actually tells us otherwise. So um, this was a study that was presented at ASCO in 2018. It was a multi-center randomized prospective study evaluating the optimal radiation dose of definitive concurrent chemoradiation for inoperable esophageal squamous cell carcinomas. This study included 300 patients with locally advanced disease, and they were then randomized to either get concurrent chemoradiation to 60 gray, which is considered dose escalation or higher dose than standard, or um, just standard chemoradiation to 50 gray. Patients after they completed chemoradiation were able to recover and then went on to get some consolidation chemotherapy after which they were followed. And the radiation completion rate uh, was high in, in both arms, but uh, in the low dose arm, it was higher but there were no uh, significant differences in the completion of concurrent weekly chemo uh, or consolidation chemo between the two arms. The, there was a median follow-up of 14.4 months. Uh, notably, there was no statistically significant difference in toxicity between the high dose and the standard dose arms, but you can see there's also no statistically significant differences in local regional progression-free survival overall progression-free survival or overall, overall survival. So uh, the conclusion based on, on this study was that a total radiation dose of 50 gray uh, is the recommended dose for definitive concurrent chemoradiation in esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, even more recently at GI ASCO this year, the Art Deco study was presented. And this is a randomized control phase three multicenter study on dose escalation and definitive chemoradiation for patients with locally advanced esophageal cancer. 
Unlike the other study, which only included squamous cell carcinoma patients, this study included both adenocarcinoma patients and squamous cell carcinoma patients. About 40% of patients in the study had adenocarcinoma and 60% had squamous cell carcinoma. And the concurrent chemotherapy was carboplatin and paclitaxel. The primary endpoint of the Art Deco study was local progression-free survival. And in this study, the randomization was quite simple. Patients either got chemoradiation to 50.4 gray in 28 fractions, or they got a simultaneous integrated boost to a dose escalated dose of 61.6 gray in 28 fractions. So a much higher dose than what's standard. The median follow-up time was 45 months, um, and the three-year local uh, progression-free survival was 70% in the standard dose arm, 76% in the high dose arm, not statistically significant. The one year any progression-free survival was 60% for squamous cell cancers and 50% for adenocarcinoma. There was no difference though between the standard dose and the high dose. And three-year overall survival similarly was very similar between the standard dose and high dose arms, as was toxicity. So really no difference between the two arms uh, in any of the endpoints. And so the conclusion was that indefinitive chemoradiation for esophageal cancer, radiation dose escalation up to 61.6 gray to the primary tuner did not result in a significant increase in local control over the standard 50.4 gray dose. So um, overall conclusions uh, from the literature are that preoperative chemoradiation is the standard of care for esophageal adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. Concurrent chemoradiation with Folfox may be superior to carbotaxel. This has been studied in patients with adenocarcinoma. And there is no benefit to dose escalation above 50.4 gray for definitive uh, chemoradiation. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate everyone taking the time.